sometimes things aren't really what we thought they were. And sometimes we discover we were really wrong about something. I mean, tragically wrong. Today, I'm going to show you why I think your ancestors were probably smarter than you think they were. At the beginning of the 20th century, a sponge diver was in the ocean in the eastern Mediterranean when he stumbled across this ancient Greek shipwreck, and the area was saturated with archaeological goodies, you know, statues and the usual kinds of things that you find. But there was one item in the wreckage that suddenly forced us to change our perception of the ancient world. It was the remnants of a gearbox dating back to somewhere between 260 BC, and it featured some really fine mechanisms. Some of the gears had teeth as short as a millimeter, and they were incredibly complex, far more complex than we had assumed was possible at that point in history. It was a bit of a mystery, and even though we've had possession of this strange machine for more than 120 years now, it's taken us nearly that long to appreciate what we found. It appears to be an analog computer designed to measure and predict the motion of the sun, the moon, and the planets. And that's no small feat because from where we sit in the solar system, the planets appear to change direction in the sky, sometimes moving in harmony with the sun's trajectory and sometimes going in the opposite direction. That's because the planets orbit the sun and not the earth like we used to believe. Or at least we thought that's what we used to believe, and yet here was an ancient device designed to calculate planetary motion with incredible detail. Inscriptions on the inside of this incredible machine tell us exactly what this was designed to do. If you aligned it with the current night sky, you could move the dials and travel forward and backward through time to see where everything would be at any given moment. On the front of the box was a dial that showed you the positions of the stars and the planets. On the back, there were two dials, one that provided a 19-year calendar to track the cycles of the moon, and another that helped you predict solar and lunar eclipses. And that one was calibrated for a 223-month cycle. And all of that was driven by the incredibly complicated gears inside the box. Which means that more than 2,000 years ago, somebody was calculating all that stuff as well as you and I can figure it out with the astronomy app on your smartphone. Uh, of course, we know that our ancient ancestors had a very detailed knowledge of astronomy because, well, there was very little light pollution and nobody had Netflix to distract them at night. These people had all the time in the world after dark to just study the heavens. Long before the Greeks, the Babylonians were already predicting the motion of heavenly bodies with unbelievable accuracy. And they discovered that the moon went through a 19-year cycle. I mean, just imagine the patience you'd have to observe all of that. And then at some point, somebody in the Greek world translated all that knowledge, all that math, into a working machine. This analog computer. That kind of smart defies the imagination for most of us. What kind of math skills would you have to possess? What kind of imagination would you need to have? What would your grasp of spatial concepts have to be like in order to assemble all these little gears into something that can make those kinds of predictions? Those of us who predate digital watches are used to seeing intricate gears and springs inside a very small timepiece. And we know that you can more or less keep accurate track of hours, seconds, and minutes with tiny little gears. Maybe even days of the week and the date of the month depending on how expensive your watch was. But man, to keep track of Mercury, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, the Sun, the Moon, eclipses, and more, all with one machine, it kind of boggles the mind. And 
it puts to rest this idea that our ancestors were unlettered simpletons who didn't have access to the kinds of higher thinking we think we possess. These were not some flat earth imbeciles whose existence was driven by mere superstition. And something tells me that even though some of my ancient ancestors in Northern Europe apparently believed the earth was the center of the universe, these people knew better. I mean, how else do you account for a machine that can accurately predict the prograde and retrograde movement of the planets? You know, sometimes we like to think of the ancients as people who had barely escaped from their caves. But the more we dig out of the earth, the more we learn that in some ways, you and I would have a lot of catching up to do if we could magically be transported back to their time. I mean, sure. We've accumulated more information today, and the collective body of human knowledge has dramatically expanded since the day that Greek ship sank. But we've also become lazy, allowing smartphones to do a lot of our thinking for us. Now, that's not to say that everybody in the ancient world was a good thinker, because obviously that wouldn't be true. Society had its smart people and its not-so-smart people back then, too. And the Antikythera mechanism, the name we've given this machine, was probably invented by one of the brighter specimens of the day. But still, it was a time when people largely had to do all their math in their head, and so their mental skills were obviously pretty impressive. You know, once upon a time, I actually had a science teacher when I was a kid who wouldn't let us use a calculator until we proved that we could do the math the hard way first with paper and pencil. And right about now, I'm starting to appreciate that because I could see that teacher was doing us a favor. I sometimes think we're losing a lot of essential skills because of all the digital shortcuts we've created, but I'm getting a little off topic. Given the fact that the Antikythera mechanism was discovered in a shipwreck, I'm tempted to believe that it was probably a navigation tool, a method of charting your course against the stars. In later years, we used a compass and a sextant to determine our position. But maybe back when this thing was created, it had even better calculations. And I, I guess what I'm driving at today is the deep fascination we seem to have for the heavens. Not only do we find the night sky beautiful, we find it incredibly useful. It's a precision calendar that shows up every night right above our heads. And it's so exact that it led to this idea during the Enlightenment period that the universe kind of runs like a watch or a machine. Now, if you've ever been to the city of Cusco down in Peru, you've probably been blown away by the stunning architecture of the Incas. And for a long time, people wondered why the Inca emperor Pachacutec, who built Cusco, arranged the street in his city, the streets rather, in such an odd pattern. You and I tend to make our roads perpendicular to each other at 90 degrees. But in Cusco, the alignment seems a little off, right? It's not perpendicular. And it seems off until you realize what he was doing. At one time of the year, one of the main streets lined up with the Milky Way. And on another important day, another street lined up with the Milky Way. So it turns out that the whole town might have been a celestial calendar, and you could tell what time of year it was just by looking up at the night sky. Pretty ingenious. But you know, our fascination with the heavens runs much deeper than mere timekeeping. Somehow, in addition to finding the night sky useful, we also find it meaningful. Most of us get the distinct sense there must be something out there, something that will help us determine who or what we are as human beings. And even though the distances in our galactic neighborhood are completely mind-boggling, I mean, the sun is 93 million miles away, and the next nearest star is more than 25 trillion miles away, yet somehow we have this urge, this belief, that we might be able to find something important out there. Why? I'll be right back in a moment so we can think about that a little bit more. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. 
Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. Like most of you, I was absolutely delighted to hear that William Shatner was going to be among the first civilians to go into space on Jeff Bezos' rocket ship. At 90 years of age, he was the oldest person to ever leave the planet, and it just, well, I don't know, seemed appropriate. I mean, he was Captain Kirk, and I was one of those kids who religiously watched Star Trek when it first came out. I'm also from the generation that grew up with the Apollo missions and the lunar landings, the golden age of space exploration. And like millions of other kids, it was my ambition to become an astronaut. Of course, at the time, I, I didn't realize that Canada didn't really have much of a space program, and the likelihood of becoming an astronaut was incredibly small for me. But that wouldn't have mattered. I mean, I was a space fanatic. So much so that when my family moved in the middle of second grade, my class gave me a book about the moon landings as a going away present. And to this day, whenever I get the chance, I love to go to a really dark place and just look up into the sky. Unfortunately, we are running out of places where light pollution doesn't ruin the experience. But for a while, I did have the chance to live on the Alaska Highway, where the nights are very dark and the views of the night sky are breathtaking, even though the best views always seem to coincide with minus 40 degrees. You know, there's just something magnificent about that universe that pulls us in its direction. It tugs at our hearts. Somehow, we all sense there's something out there. It's a phenomenon as old as the human race. In fact, I'm reminded of the eighth Psalm written some 3,000 years ago, which does a really nice job of describing some of the emotions we feel when we realize just how big that universe is. Now, I've read you this Psalm in the past, but I wanna read just a little bit of it to you again. It says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? You know, sometimes we like to think that the ancients didn't realize how big our cosmic neighborhood was, but here we have David who suddenly realizes that God has a lot of universe to deal with out there. And yet somehow God makes time for a piddly human being who isn't even a speck on the galactic playing field. Something about the heavens makes us feel really small and at the same time kind of important. And it fills us with wonder and deep emotion. It's almost as if, well, life is supposed to mean something. And I think that's really what drives us to leave the Earth's gravitational pull, to go out there and explore. Somehow, we think we're going to find something. We think we're going to discover deep secrets that will help us unpack the real nature of human existence. We think we're going to find where we came from as a species, how we got here, and maybe we can figure out then where we might be headed. We've put robots on Mars to collect soil samples, hoping to find water, a key ingredient for life, and maybe even bacteria, which would mean we aren't the only life forms out there. Some people wonder if maybe Mars used to be inhabited, but then somehow became a wasteland that could no longer sustain life. What would that mean for life on Earth? What could we learn about the past if that happened to be true? And what could we learn about the future? Why, why do we have this fascination with the thought that we might not be alone in the universe? Why do movies like E.T. or Close Encounters appeal to us so strongly? I mean, you could say it's just entertainment, but the box office success of movies about extraterrestrial contact suggests otherwise to me from contact to arrival to the day the Earth stood still, it sometimes seems like we're obsessed with the idea that we should not be alone. Maybe you've heard of the Drake Equation. Back in 1961, astronomer Frank Drake developed a formula to determine the probability of finding other life in this universe. He took all kinds of variables into account. How many stars there are in our galaxy? How many of them might have planets? How many of those planets might be able to support life? How many of those life-supporting planets might have intelligent life? And then how many of those intelligent beings might have the technology to send us a signal? 
Depending on the estimated values for each variable, the Drake formula has been used to predict anywhere from 20 to 50 million other inhabited worlds right here in the Milky Way. Of course, the fact we've heard from none of them and the fact that nobody has ever responded to signals we send into space probably lowers the probability quite a bit. And if somebody else did exist out there, the odds of lining up some kind of cosmic rendezvous are definitely against us. If the closest star is 25 trillion miles, long distance space travel is going to have to mean traveling faster than the speed of light. I mean, if you don't want to die of old age on your first trip. And of course, Einstein assured us that traveling faster than the speed of light is not possible. The only way you could get a bunch of humans that far out into space is to build kind of a space ark where you have children in space and grandchildren and great grandchildren and then maybe one of those generations would finally arrive at the destination. Of course, that concept would be complicated by the exceptionally high levels of radiation in space, which would make childbearing incredibly risky. After astronaut Scott Kelly spent one year in space, we discovered that the gene expression emerging from his DNA had changed thanks to cosmic radiation. So much so that it was 7% different from his twin brother. We've discovered that space travel makes permanent changes to your gene expression. So what would happen over several generations raised in a spaceship? I mean, the whole thing seems, well, unlikely. So even if we did get a signal from a distant civilization, a signal that might be thousands of years old when we finally got it, the likelihood of ever meeting up without cracking the secrets of wormholes, well, it's pretty low. Of course, that doesn't mean there isn't life out there. From a Christian perspective, it just seems unlikely that an infinite God with an appetite for creativity would only make the one inhabited planet. You know, one of the most frequent questions I get is whether or not the Bible talks about other worlds and other civilizations. And the answer is, well, yeah, obviously it does, because the Bible mentions angelic visitors who clearly come from somewhere else. But apart from angels, does the Bible talk about other inhabited worlds? Well, not explicitly, but it does drop some interesting clues along the way. And one of the first of those comes to us from the book of Hebrews, which opens with that majestic description of Christ. And it identifies him not only as the Son of God, but as the Creator. Here it is right now at the top of the book of Hebrews. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. So, we do have some otherworldly communication taking place right here in a clear statement that the earth has indeed been visited by someone from the outside, the Son of God. But then it says this, whom, Jesus, He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds. Not only is Christ the Creator, but it also says He made the worlds, plural, as in more than one. Now, that might not exactly be what you think, because the original Greek word for worlds is aeon. It's where we get the word eon. So what it might be saying is that God the Son created the ages, and as in He, he invented the concept of time and history. But the idea that there might be other worlds is certainly an allowable interpretation here. It's not absolute proof, but it is a possibility. And right now, in this world, it's time for another quick break. So don't go away. I'm going to show you a few other possibilities as soon as I come back. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now, or give us a call, and start your journey of discovery. Right before the break, we were starting to look at Bible passages that might suggest there are other inhabited worlds. But I guess before we keep going, I want to ask the question, why do we care? And what do we think we're going to find? Why is this so important to us? Why would it matter? 
especially if the likelihood of contact is actually really, really low. What are we looking for? Why do we think there are answers about the nature of humanity to be found up there in the sky? I mean, why do we seem to think there are any answers at all? If we buy the current thinking about the emergence of life on Earth, we have to deal with the idea that everything that ever happened is nothing but the product of chance. Somehow, the collision of cosmic molecules gave us the incredibly complex phenomenon of human consciousness. Somehow, an accident of physics produced us, living, thinking beings who spend long, long hours contemplating the nature of our own existence. And if we really got here by chance, that means that everything that ever happened to us is just the product of chance, too. Because you wouldn't be able to find any discernible meaning behind absolutely anything. Now, for me, that's a d deeply depressing thought. And for some reason, our human brains are wired to fight against the thought of meaninglessness. In fact, our brain's desire to find meaning and explanation might actually be the reason we seem to be so susceptible to conspiracy theories. When really bad things happen and we can't find a good reason for them, then our brains start to fabricate a reason. We're not just happy with bad things just happening to us. We start to tell ourselves that natural disasters happen because somebody engineered them. It's those mad scientists in Alaska messing around with HARP. It's chemtrails. It's whatever the latest conspiracy theory is. We convince ourselves that bad things happen because a shadowy cabal of elites is behind the scenes pulling the strings. When there's no discernible pattern, our brains invent one because we have this overwhelming urge to discover meaning. And the idea that we got here by accident, that life has no meaning or no guaranteed future, we find that deeply troubling. So we find ourselves searching the skies looking for answers. If there is another civilization out there, maybe we could compare notes with those people and finally understand who we are. But now let's get back to the Bible and see what it says about life on other worlds. We've already looked at Hebrews chapter 1, which has a slight, tiny, possible hint that other worlds might exist. Let's compare that now to a passage you find over in the book of Isaiah chapter 45, which raises another interesting possibility. Isaiah 45, 18 says, for thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. What this is suggesting is that God doesn't waste creative effort. If he made something, there's a reason he made it. The earth was made to be inhabited, a home for the human race. Of course, there are eight other planets in our solar system if you still count Pluto. And so far, we're pretty sure none of the rest are inhabited. But that doesn't mean that the other planets are just nothing but eye candy. Maybe it's possible a massive gas giant like Jupiter is a magnet that attracts incoming space debris. Or maybe the gravitational pull and orbit of the other planets serves to keep the Earth stable. I mean, who, who really knows? But then when you consider the fact that there are something like 100 billion stars in our galaxy, and we've counted more than 100 billion other galaxies out there as big as ours, that starts to suggest that if God made all those worlds out there, it's probably not likely they were all created in vain. So far, using our limited ability to see things, we've discovered something like 3,000 exoplanets around other stars. And some of them might be orbiting in what we call the Goldilocks zone that incredibly narrow band you find exactly the right distance from a star to enable liquid water and some of the other ingredients you need for life. So again, this is not a definitive statement, but the Bible does suggest that God does not create in vain. And the unbelievable vastness of this universe then suggests there might be other worlds out there, or at least it doesn't rule it out. Okay, we got to get to one more text before I run out of time. This one comes from the book of Job. It's this scene where it says the sons of God attend a meeting in God's presence. And here's the way it reads, starting right in Job chapter 1. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. 
Satan, of course, is the ultimate fallen angel, the leader of the angelic rebellion. And when God asks him, where have you been? He says, from going to and fro on the earth. Now, in the ancient world, your foot was a symbol of ownership. I mean, you could only step on something if you owned it. And so what Satan is saying is that he owns planet earth. In the opening pages of Genesis, the human race was given dominion over this planet. But then they were deceived into giving that dominion to the serpent. And you'll notice this scene in Job is a meeting of the sons of God, and Adam in Luke chapter 3 is called a son of God. So what appears to be happening in Job is that a human representative for earth is missing, and the devil appears in his place because he now lays claim to this planet. And that, of course, raises the tantalizing possibility that the other sons of God might be coming from other worlds, kind of like a galactic council. Does it prove it? No, absolutely not. But it does seem to suggest it. Okay, I gotta take one last break, so hang on to your galactic seat belts. This is all gonna go by in at warp speed, and I'll be right back. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. Something out there pulls our hearts in the direction of heaven. For thousands of years, we've been looking up into the night sky expecting to find something. So what if it's God pulling your heart in that direction? What if this old book actually shows you what or who you've been looking for your whole life? What if the voice that tugs your heart toward that night sky is the same voice that inspired this book? What if the urge toward the heavens is a homing beacon pulling you back towards an authentic human existence? And you will seek me and find me, God says, when you search for me with all your heart. A diver off the coast of Antikythera made a revolutionary discovery that changed our picture of the whole ancient world. What appeared to be a clump of mud proved to be one of the most important artifacts we've ever found. And what I'm going to suggest is that maybe it's time to dive into another place, into the incredible depths of the Bible. I know, you think you know what the Bible says because the skeptics have been telling you what's in this book and why you should avoid it. But I gotta tell you, after decades of reading this, I say the skeptics are dead wrong. This book is going to open up a whole new world for you and prove that this universe is even bigger than you thought. Thanks for joining me again this week. I'm Sean Boonstrom. This has been another episode of Authentic.